All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, on this week's session of Getting Technical. Uh, as always, I'm Mason Day with Dan Gillespie from J.R. Peters, and we're here to break down uh, technical topics for your grow. So, Dan, uh, last week, you know, we had a good chat about how we here at Jax develop nutrition schedules uh, and programs. And once a grower gets dialed in, you know, with a schedule, is there anything else they should be accounting for and monitoring? I know that, uh, you know, I hear a lot about those acronyms out there, PH, EC, PPMs. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of numbers, targets, and things can get confusing. So uh, let, what, what, what should we be focusing on? Definitely. So there certainly is uh, some components that you need to consider after you select the fertilizer formulas that are going to hit your nutrient targets and, and are going to be used to build out your nutrition schedule and program. Um, and one of the most important things or two of the most important things is we need to ensure that we're uh, after we mix our fertilizer, um, we are adjusting the solution to the proper pH and ensuring that our EC is within our expected range. OK, let's start there with pH. What pH should our solution be? Sure. So for most crops, Mason, that are going to be grown in soilless grow media, such as cocoa core or rock wool, we want the pH to be right around 5.8 to 6.2 is kind of that sweet spot. Now for crops grown in field soil, the pH can be a little bit higher, kind of in a 6.5 to 7.0 range. So what happens is outside of these optimum ranges, pH will negatively impact nutrient availability and the solubility of the fertilizer. So for these reasons, nutrient disorders can to begin to occur as we stray outside of these optimum ranges, even if a sufficient, excuse me, even if a sufficient supply of nutrients is being delivered to the plant. Now, Jack's Nutrients does contain three different forms of chelates to ensure that nutrient availability is going to be optimized over a very broad pH range. But it's still critical and still important to ensure that our solution is at our optimum pH range before feeding our plants. You know, that's that's really important what you said there, because, uh, you know, so I got it. So a range is 5.8 to 6.2. And, you know, for soilless media, which is cocoa, uh, core and rock wool. Uh, and then, you know, 6.5 to 7.0 for field grown crops in soil and that's acceptable for most crops. And you know, I think what is it what's interesting there is that when we talk about pH and you know acidity, a lot of people think that uh, if a pH gets, you know, to 5.0 and they start seeing you know, things in their plants, they think it's like acid burning their plants. When in reality, it could just be that it's a nutrient disorder because it's not having to do with the burn but it's that those plants aren't able to absorb those specific nutrients in that range. And I think that that, uh, you know, sometime it doesn't click in uh, yeah. our brains as what's the first case scenario, but uh, it's a good point that you brought up there. Definitely. So, so if you get one of these pHs that's outside this optimal range or optimal range, what should we do to adjust that, to get it back into those ranges? Sure. So any type of acid mason is going to lower your pH. So common acid sources in horticulture include phosphoric acid, citric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. Um, I personally prefer sulfuric acid because it's nice and cheap. Um, it's effective and it doesn't throw your nutrient balance and nutrient ratios off too much. So it makes things fairly easy. Um, whereas a nitric acid, you really have to account for that nitrogen that you're adding to the solution. Now, on the other hand, raising your pH is gonna be done by uh, some type of base. Um, it is less common in horticulture to need to raise your pH, but you still certainly need to do that in some cases. Um, and when you do need to raise the pH, I like to use Jack's potassium bicarbonate. Um, so this product will raise your pH, but it will also add some alkalinity to your water, which will help stabilize and buffer the pH of pure water sources such as RO um, and reverse osmosis sources. All right. So following along there, you know, sulfuric acid, what I heard was it's the well tequila of the nutrient world. It's strong, it's cheap, and it still gets the job done. <laughs> no, uh, just kidding. But 
You know, so when you are trying to adjust the pH, should that be a done before or after you're mixing your fertilizer? Good question. Um, so it's best to do it after you mix the fertilizer, Mason. So what I always recommend is mixing your fertilizer to start, checking your pH after you mix the fertilizer to see how the fertilizer has changed the pH because it will change it to some level. And that will vary depending on which formula you're using. So that's step one is mixing your fertilizer. Then you want to check your pH and then add or adjust your pH from there to, uh, to hit that desired range. Got it. All right. So adjusting pH after mixing fertilizer, we got that covered. The next thing I want to talk about is EC. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about EC, how to monitor it. What is it? Yep. So EC is going to stand for electrical conductivity. And in horticulture, we use EC to measure the soluble salts in a solution or in the grow media. And this is going to provide an indication of the fertility levels or if any salinity problems are likely to occur or exist. There are some limitations to this measurement, the main being it does not provide specific element concentration. So it's not going to tell us how the concentration of nitrogen, the concentration of potassium in a solution, but it does tell us, you know, what is the overall soluble salt picture of that solution or of that grow media. So it is a very useful measurement. All right, so EC, definitely useful, but what should our EC be? Well, it depends, Mason. So as we discussed in our previous video, we are not necessarily targeting EC, but we are rather targeting specific element concentrations for each plant nutrient. The EC is going to be a result of hitting these nutrient targets. For example, in the vegetative state of most flowering or fruiting crops, we want to provide somewhere between 150 to 200 parts per million of nitrogen to the plant. The EC is going to be a result of delivering this amount of nitrogen to the plant. Nevertheless, EC is still a valuable measurement that is going to give us a good indication of some things. Okay, so it makes sense. Uh, so if I'm understanding correctly, our main concern is hitting the individual nutrient concentration targets. And basically the EC is what's resulting from us hitting those targets. And it's kind of what we can measure to know we're in the right spot. Exactly. It's what we can measure in-house, in a greenhouse, in a grow room. And we don't have to send an analysis to a lab. So it's kind of a quick and dirty check. Got it. All right. So, you know, that's it's kind of you think about it in the in medical sense, right? You go to a doctor and uh, they might not necessarily send you to a lab to get test results done, but they're gonna give you a quick check. And a lot of times that's what you need. So what you're saying is, is that while EC isn't a direct uh, measurement of the specific nutrient concentrations, uh, individual concentrations in a nutrient solution, it is a valuable measurement. Yes, it certainly is Mason. And it certainly should always be measured and monitored. So the EC of a solution should be always be checked after mixing fertilizer, and it should be checked against the manufacturer's reference EC, which can be found on our nutrition schedules on, online. However, it should be noted that this reference EC, it's a great reference, but it is based on distilled water. So if a grower is using a source water that has some level of soluble salts or EC to begin with, um, this starting EC should be added to the reference EC. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, some folks that are growing in tap water, they come in and they say, well, my EC is off the charts. And that's when I send them to you. But now I understand that, you know, they're, they're using water that already has some salts in it. So their EC is going to be a little different. Got it. Got it. So EC can almost act as a check to ensure that everything was mixed properly before feeding your crop. But is there anything else that it's used for? Certainly is. So measuring the EC of a grow media and or our runoff or leachate solution is an extremely valuable measurement as this provides an indication of the fertility level of the actual root zone, which can be quite different from the input solution that you're feeding your plants. So measuring the EC and the volume of the media or the runoff or leachate solution can really aid in determining our fertigation frequency, the volume of fertigation that we're providing to the plant, 
and our fertigation strategy, which we'll cover in another video. All right. Well, you know, Dan, I think we covered a lot today, discussed how important, you know, monitoring pH and EC are and kind of the real science behind those things. You know, it, some things, you know, you, you hear rumors and get caught up in, you know, what things stand for, what do they actually do? And so this was great. So I just wanted to say that uh, thanks again for joining me this week. And uh, yeah, we're excited to keep doing these videos. And again, I'm, this is to you, all of the viewers out there. If you have any more questions or things that you want us to talk about, shoot us uh, you know, a, a comment on Instagram or send us an email and we'll happily uh, get on one of these sessions and discuss it and you'll get the scientific uh, response. So again, thanks guys. Have a great weekend, happy holidays, and uh, we'll see you next time.